I was driving with my stepson to the, sc uh, the school bus stop a couple of years ago, and it was during his A-levels, and you know, he was thinking about what degree he's going to take. And so I was asking him some questions about what he was drawn to. Are you drawn to uh, social philanthropy? Are you drawn to business? Or perhaps something you know, within the environmental sphere. And he said to me, well, I'd like to help people, but I think I'd like to make some money, so business. So I said to him, you know, you can combine both of those because there's a lot of commercial focus um, on a range of sustainable issues, uh, a lot of opportunity. And after a few minutes, he said to me, um, Conrad, the star is a sun. And as that star burns, it's consuming its own mass, and that mass is finite. And when that mass runs out, the star will die, along with all life as we know it on Earth. So what's the point of sustainability? We are simply prolonging the inevitable. I didn't see that coming. <laughs> Ambushed by a 17-year-old atheist at 7 o'clock in the morning. Um, it reminds me of a bumper sticker I once saw, and it says... Um, employ a teenager today while they still know everything. Um, and uh, perhaps they do, or at least all the really good questions. Um, I'm in a small, really fortunate group of people in that I really, really love what I do. I'm a coffee trader, and in the last 20 years, coffee has taken me to 42 countries around the world. And I've had some incredible experiences along the way. I've danced with a tribal queen of Cameroon in her living room in her hometown of Banganti after too many shots of Jack Daniels. Um, the king was there. Um, and I spent a terrified night alone in uh, a derelict house in Angola and actually slept with my back up against the door. So if anyone came for me in the middle of the night, I would wake up. And through all of those experiences, what I have learned is actually that we're all pretty much the same. Um, that we share similar hopes and aspirations. Um, that we share the same need for safety, uh, for justice, uh, and for dignity. What we don't share, though, is equal access to resources, education, finance, even the internet. And it's often the access to these resources that influences the way we perceive both ourselves and the way we perceive others. I take a lot of clients to rural African or rural coffee farming regions, and I was on a trip recently with a client um, in Uganda, and we stopped and we chatted to this gentleman who's been farming coffee on the same piece of land for 60 years. And after a short tour of his shamba, his small plot of land, we stopped to chat. He in his bare feet and his dirty shirt and his hard hands. Uh, and my client, as soon as we stopped, started to give him a stream of advice on what he could do to improve his farming methods, to improve his yield, and to improve his income. So well intended. But at no point did he stop and ask the farmer what he felt his needs were, you know, what he thought his challenges were. And I came away from that conversation, re conversation realizing that somehow his wealth and education had trumped those 60 years of experience and that poverty is often mistaken for ignorance. Um, quick hit of my water. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, coffee's grown in a, <clears throat> in a belt of countries that straddle the equator and consume predominantly in the northern hemisphere countries. And another way to look at that is that coffee is grown in poor countries and consumed in wealthy countries. More than 50% of the world's coffee is grown by an estimated 30 million small-scale farmers in over 45 countries. When you look at the World Bank's list of nations by wealth, 198 down, of the bottom 30, the poorest 30, 21 are coffee-producing countries. When you look at the International Monetary Fund's list of highly indebted poor countries, these are the bottom 40. These are countries with high levels of debt, um, high levels of poverty, and low levels of development. Of these 40, 25 are coffee-producing countries. And what that means is that I work with rural, often hard-to-reach people, and help them get their product to world markets. But these people lack food security. They lack access to education, to health care, so, to credit, zero access to credit. Some of them have a life expectancy of less than 50 years, and they can expect to lose maybe one in three of their children by the age of five to malaria, malnutrition, uh, HIV, AIDS. These are the people that make up the base of the matrix that is my industry. On the flip side are, are you and I and our two and three pound cappuccinos and cafe lattes. Um, and really my intention in pointing out um, that disparity 
is, is not moral shock. It's actually to highlight the opportunity. These people are not poor because of coffee. These are poor people who happen to be farming coffee. Coffee is the opportunity and it's not the problem. You know, imagine if we could take this $90 billion retail coffee industry that feeds our hopefully growing addiction to this really sexy product and we could focus that back down the supply chain. You know, the, the potential impact uh, could change the lives of tens of millions of people, potentially entire economies. Um, this is not an original thought on my part, but I think I am in a fairly original place. As a coffee trader, I stand in the middle. I buy from the poor and I sell to the rich. And that makes me uh, the catalyst or, uh, you know, potentially uh, the linchpin in driving this social change. And I have another far more personal reason that I want to participate in this. I was born in apartheid South Africa in 1969. <clears throat> this is a tough bit for me. Um, and because of the color of my skin, I was the recipient or the beneficiary of a system that oppressed tens of millions of people because of the color of their skin. Um, and in looking back, you know, I recognized that I grew up with a total lack of awareness of what was taking place around me. Uh, in some way, my um, uh, moral compass was broken. Until the age of 17. At 17, I was conscripted into the South African Army, and I spent uh, the next two years in the northern Namibian desert fighting on the periphery of the Angolan Civil War. And I came back from that and realized that uh, maybe all was not quite right. So my truth is, is that when I look back, I was guilty of apathy and inaction in the face of um, a social system that has left my country traumatized even today, you know, crime, violence, poverty, racial hatred. So I came to a point in my coffee career when I look back, oh, I just looked at my situation, and I thought, you know, I could get to 65, uh, make a tidy pile of cash and retire and look back and only realize I've made the same mistake again. Apathy and inaction in the face of people's oppression through poverty. And this changed my behavior. So my business became, while remaining for profit, became a vehicle for social change. And what I said to my staff was, is the one ground rule that we need to have is that um, wherever we trade, we need to have a positive impact. What I struggled with initially is how I fitted this very kind of personal social agenda into a for-profit business until I read Bill Gates' opening address at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2008. As I see it, there are two great forces of human nature, self-interest and caring for others. Capitalism harnesses self-interest, but only on behalf of those who can pay. Philanthropy and government aid channel our caring for those who can't pay, but the resources run out before they meet the need. To provide rapid improvement for the poor, we need a system that draws in innovators and business in a far better way than we do today. Such a system would have a twin mission, making profit and also improving the lives for those who don't fully benefit from market forces. Well, I came out of the closet right there. Um, but basically, Bill had given me the nod. And I was in my capitalist suit and my social entrepreneur underwear, or social entrepreneur suit with capitalist underwear, depending on who I was talking to. Um, the challenge still remained, though, is how did I make money and make a difference at the same time? And I found the answer in three things. Sustainability, community, and collaboration. You know, we all recognize today that, well, sustainability is uh, one of the hottest buzzwords in the world today because we all recognize that we are plowing through our resources faster than we can replenish them. Um, and that we all need to change the way we acquire, consume, and discard. Um, you know, sustainability is an individual responsibility for all of us. So that means this, uh, you know, if, if we in wealthy communities are struggle to find the will with all our resources to make those changes, how do we expect people in impoverished communities to embrace social and environmental change when they live on or below the breadline? You know, when you're poor, your time horizon is much shorter and your priorities, you operate from a completely different set of priorities. What this means is, is that the biggest hurdle in the path of sustainability in coffee is poverty. So poverty alleviation and sustainability are bound together. What we have to do is increase the revenue stream back to those farmers to incentivize and pay for the changes that we need them to make. 
So I took a step back and you know, looked at how this high value retail product, why it loses so much value um, between the coffee tree and the coffee cup. And what I found, where I found the answer was in the length of the supply chain. The supply chain is not just long in the linear sense of distance and time, it's long in complexity and risk. Complexity because of the sheer number of processes that coffee has to go through um, between the tree and the cup, uh, and the number of times it changes ownership and changes hands. The risk because of the countries where it's grown. These are countries that are landlocked with poor neighbors, uh, poor governance, lack of infrastructure, they're in conflict or post-conflict, they have uh, no credit structures, um, they have a host of problems. The result of the complexity and the risk inside that supply chain is this culture of buy low and sell high. Every single participant, every single participant in that supply chain tries to buy as low as they can and maximize the profit that they make to offset the risk. Okay. So what I realized was that I couldn't take control of that supply chain and the only way we could change that culture and reduce that risk and capture that lost revenue to feed it back to farmers was by working together through collaboration. And that's what we do. I build collaborative supply chains between farmers and coffee roasters. We create a gathering point for all these participants. And what we say to them is, is that we recognize every process between the tree and the cup has, requires a certain resource and skill set. Um, that every process has its own costs, you know, costs of, of doing business, and that every process carries its own risk and has its own challenges. But by collaboration, we pool our resources. We recognize the real cost, not the inflated cost. And what we try to ensure is that everybody receives a profit in proportion of value that they bring to that supply chain. What you get from collaboration is a recognition of real cost, a reduction of risk, and efficiency, and efficiency is, is a cost saving in itself. The fantastic byproducts of collaboration are that you create trust through transparency and you create cohesion through working together. Um, I don't think that collaboration belongs only in the coffee supply chain. I think that collaboration belongs in every single supply chain, regardless of the product. The easiest place to sell collaboration is in to smallholder communities because they naturally collaborate every day of their lives. The hardest place to sell collaboration is to large corporate entities because they exist in a culture of competition. And while I recognize that competition exists as a kind of cornerstone to our free market economy, um, what I question is its presence inside of the supply chain, particularly where you have really long, opaque supply chains and you have a huge supermarket at the top applying price pressure and on the other end is the small-scale farmer who has the least amount of resources and ability to negotiate. So unintentionally, that supply chain uh, becomes predatory. Um, coffee is really the canary in the coal mine for a far bigger problem, and that problem is global food security. I read a report by the Fair Trade Foundation that says 70% of our staple foods grown on earth are grown by small-scale farmers. <clears throat> Excuse me. These farmers more than likely share the same economic backdrop as small-scale coffee farmers. So that would mean poverty alleviation has to be the biggest hurdle in the face of global food security. And if that's the case, that moves the addressing poverty out of the altruistic caring for others and straight into the realm of self-interest. And we need to worry about where we're going to get our food from in the future, and we need to start looking after the people that grow it. You know, this global challenge needs a global response. One half of the world cannot carry the other half. We need to collaborate to do this. Business today has to accept the double bottom line of profit plus social responsibility. And we, as consumers, are probably the strongest community in the world, the most powerful community in the world. We need to reward companies that show social responsibility, and we need to penalize companies that don't by spending our money somewhere else. The media tell us a hundred times a day in a hundred different ways um, that money is the only currency of wealth, that success is measured in pounds and pence and dollars and cents, and I think this is a false economy. You know, I drive home from work in the evening and I see children hanging out in the parking lot of my local superstore, 
And there might be new trainers, and I know they have guaranteed a warm house and they have a television at home, but I see a level of spiritual poverty there that I don't see when I go to rural Africa. When I meet those communities, we meet under the meeting tree, and every single person gets to stand up and introduce themselves and to say what their role and responsibility is inside of their community. Every person, regardless of how long that takes, and it can be a long time. <laughs> but there's power in that. You know, we are... We're natural collaborators. We're, we do it through our natural need to belong in community. So I would say to my son that I want him to lead a happy and fulfilled life. And regardless of his beliefs, I think self-caring or self-interest and caring for others is part of the same whole. I think that sustainability, poverty alleviation, um, and commercial success are all bound together. And that when you get a little bit older, you look at your parents and you see your heritage, and you look at your children and you see your legacy. And in closing, I wanted to share with you an African proverb that I thought was quite fitting. It's, if you want to travel swiftly, go alone. But if you want to travel far, go together. Thank you very much. <laughs>